happy Wednesday, everyone. Hope you're all doing uh, well this day. So I just want to say a big thank you to everyone in the audience for taking the time to do whatever it takes to invest in your personal and professional success and for spending time with us. I also want to say a big thank you to Sersha, Christina and the Iconic Offices team for having such an amazing platform for speakers like myself and also other experts to just share uh, different thoughts, ideas uh, and um, different events as we go along. So um, today's session is uh, really exciting and I'm really thrilled to be part of this. So uh, we're gonna cover a lot of ideas and concepts on developing uh, thought leadership for impact and influence. So there's gonna be a lot of materials which we'll cover today. We'll leave, we'll definitely leave some time uh, towards the end for Q&A. So feel free to take down notes as we go along. Uh, but if I'm talking too fast, let me know because uh, I do tend to go quite quickly uh, if I'm really excited, which I am. So just a brief background about myself, if you're wondering who is this person speaking to you. So my name is Dominic. Uh, you can call me Dom. I was born in Singapore before moving over to Australia for my postgraduate studies. So to date, I've got the chance to speak on the TEDx stage twice uh, before the pandemic, thankfully. Uh, and I also had the chance to travel around the world speaking in various uh, cities and countries. So in New York, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Helsinki, uh, Gothenburg, Geneva, Amsterdam, Dublin, uh, just to name a few. Uh, currently in my day job, I'm also the head of people and culture at a marketing agency called Dadarati. Uh, previously, I've also been featured on different news and media outlets like entrepreneur.com, The Age, the Sydney Morning Herald, and uh, I did have a uh, a lot of good experiences uh, doing professional development workshops and training for the likes of uh, different organizations like Google, Intel, Tesla, and Volkswagen. And I also had the chance to interview different high performers like US Navy SEALs, Olympians, fighter pilots, surgeons, and Michelin star chefs. Um, so it's always a pleasure and privilege to uh, meet with different people. And as much as I'm talking a lot today, uh, it's all about how we can learn from each other because we must always make it a point to invest in our own knowledge and expertise because the world which we live in is very unpredictable. It is very volatile and uncertain. So the best way, uh, one of the best things which we can do for ourselves is actually uh, invest in our own growth so that we can always stay ahead of the curve and we can always hone our competitive edge. All right, cool. So uh, some housekeeping rules before we formally begin. So uh, do take down as much notes as you can, whether on your PC, on your tablet, on your phone, or even on a traditional hard copy notebook, because we're going to cover quite a bit of uh, ideas today. Uh, the next thing is to engage as well. So if you have any questions at all, uh, if you don't want to leave it towards the end, you can feel free to unmute yourself, feel free to interrupt me, uh, pop some uh, comments or feedback into the chat box as well. All right, so that I can know how you're feeling about things, how you're reacting, how you are responding to some of the ideas which uh, we are presenting. And uh, also do ask me questions, all right? So whether you want to leave it towards the end or as we go along, feel free to just pop it into the chat and I'll see it and I'll try my best to answer it uh, on the spot, okay? Perfect. So how, how is everyone feeling right now? Is everyone excited? Is everyone doing okay in your part of the world during these interesting times? Everyone's going to do it. All right. Very nice. Uh, good to meet you all as well. So even though I'm on the other side of the world, uh, it was definitely a very nice privilege to meet with the iconic team uh, when I was able to tr travel over to Dublin in February 2019. So hopefully we'll be able to meet uh, each other really soon in the flesh, uh, especially once the borders uh, open up. So really looking forward to that. Okay, so let's just jump straight into uh, the materials, right? So Guy Kawasaki, he said this, a thought leader is someone who creates something before people realize that they need it. Best example, of course, is Steve Jobs, Richard Branson too. All right, so thought leadership, uh, there are two parts to thought leadership. So the first part is thought, which is your thinking, which is your ideas, which is the concepts or the beliefs that you have, 
All right. And then leadership, the next part of uh, thought leadership is leadership, which is all about um, influence. So basically, uh, thought leadership is how you can use your ideas and your way of thinking to impact and influence others, because we are always in the business of influence. So even right now, I'm trying to influence you. I'm trying to sway you towards uh, certain ideas. Uh, and likewise, so whether you're in a leadership or managerial position or not, we are always influencing. As long as you're communicating, you're always in the business of influence, right? So which is why thought leadership is something which is really, really handy, um, not just for our career growth, but even in our lives as well. So when you are in a relationship, in your social circle, uh, using thought leadership uh, is is essentially uh, using influence, the tools of influence uh, to be able to uh, influence the decision making, uh, the ideas um, and the choices which others make. All right. So a few things which were covered today. So the first one is the importance of thought leadership and influence. So why should we bother uh, thinking about this? Uh, next, we'll touch on the thought leadership 5M, uh, which is comprised of your mission, the message, the market, the mood, as well as the measure. All right, so the mission is the purpose behind uh, why you're doing what you're doing. The message is what you're trying to convey. The market is your target audience. The mode is your channel. And the measure is how are you going to track uh, success? How do you actually uh, have, what kinds of measures of success are you going to have? All right, and then we'll wrap things up. Very nice. So the first thing is the importance of thought leadership and influence. So why is thought leadership important? Can anyone tell me why? Does anyone have any ideas? So feel free to pop something into the chat. So create new ideas, yes. So, so that's a good one. So whenever you have new ideas and you've, you're trying to spread those ideas, you definitely need to convince people to buy into your ideas, which is, why, uh, which is where thought leadership comes in. All right. So uh, Simona says to spread ideas and to make people understand that our stance matters. Yes, to build and Anne also mentioned to build good rapport. Correct. Right. right. Yeah. So a lot of uh, political leaders, they do that, um, whether we believe in it or not, because they are in a business of influence. And just like if you're uh, in marketing or uh, in advertising, you're also in the business of influence. Uh, if you're customer facing, you're in the business of influence. Even if you're in healthcare, if you're trying to convince people to make good, healthy decisions for the sake of public health and safety, which we know that is very important, uh, even in today's interesting times, you are also in the business of influence, right? Uh, and Katya says uh, to bring something new and valuable. Exactly. Yeah. So to pretty much get people to buy into our idea, uh, we require thought leadership. So uh, thanks so much uh, all for sharing. So the other reason um, why thought leadership is so important is because we live in a very, very competitive world. It is becoming more and more uh, noisy, saturated, distracted. So there's business and information saturation. So um, there is never a shortage of information around us. In fact, there is an overabundance of information informational overload. Uh, There's so many things competing for our attention. So definitely thought leadership allows you to cut through the noise, but also convey things that really matter, things that actually um, that allow you to connect with uh, the, the, the truest customer needs to see things from their point of view, because there is no point in just having a message and then shoving it down your audience's throats. Right, we are just missing the point if we do that. Uh, and obviously, we might know of some uh, leaders uh, who are actually trying to do that uh, without seeing, without putting themselves in the shoes of their audience first. All right, so um, it's not really about information; it's about um, targeted information and information that matters to your audience. All right. So one other thing which is really interesting in today's time is. Um, the, the rise of fake news. 
All right, so uh, other sources that are semi-credible or not even credible, because there are so many keyboard warriors right now, especially if you go onto mainstream social media outlets, people might have a stance about uh, a certain idea or a certain concept, and they might be very stubborn uh, about it. All right, so they are very adamant on defending their position, whether they consider uh, opposing points of view or not, whether they are evidence-based or um, they're backed by science or not. All right, so uh, with the rise of fake news, it is even more important for us uh, as we are leaders, as we are communicators, as we try to add value to the world to understand what's happening around us. All right, so uh, there is a war for truth. There is a war for attention. There is a war on focus as well because there's so much noise going around us. And if we don't help our target audience to build up the deep thinking skills and to be able to cut through the chatter, then we might actually lose them uh, in, in, in the noise and the distractions around us. All right, so I uh, hope this paints a, a very uh, broad overall picture of uh, on the importance of thought leadership. So the next slide is uh, looking at the stats. All right, so um, in terms of the, the commercial side of things, so um, some stats relating to TL or thought leadership. So 55% of decision makers use thought leadership content to vet businesses. Right. So even for you as a consumer, whenever you want to uh, purchase a product, right? for example, if you want to buy a car, uh, I mean, there might be certain brands that, um, that jump out at you. There are certain brands that just pique your interest. Uh, but if, if you have so many brands to choose from, generally, it is the brand that uh, make it a point to educate you, which you'll find more trustworthy. All right, so because people like to do research first. So for example, if, you, if you're on a shop for furniture and if this particular online furniture retail, uh, retailer, uh, if they provide good content on different ideas on how to spruce up your house, how to create a very nice child or family-friendly environment and nice recommendations on the materials, the fabrics, the colors uh, that, that can suit your, your, your style and your taste, uh, then you, you will naturally be more inclined uh, to go with them because they have built up trust they have built up credibility in your eyes. So they are essentially using thought leadership to drive sales, right? So instead of just pushing uh, the advertising message of buy my sofas, buy my chairs, buy my tables, instead of doing that, what they're doing is saying that, hey, uh, this is a catalog of some ideas on how, how, to, uh, how to do up your living room how to create spaces uh, that will be good for your kids, that will be good for your friends uh, and, and for different gatherings and all that, all right? So this is just one example of thought leadership, all right? 50% uh, 50, 50 of decision makers spend at least one hour a week consuming thought leadership content. And about 83% of buyers believe thought leadership builds trust in the organization, all right? So even for generic products uh, like insurance, all right, so there is nothing sexy about insurance. And a lot of times uh, we tend to be very uh, logical uh, and pragmatic about it. So we just shop for uh, the insurance brands that has the cheapest price. That's usually the case. But if they want to position themselves as an expert or as a premium brand, premium and trusted brand, uh, then some of them might actually produce uh, educational content, all right, on things like, um, like what happens uh, if you don't take care of your health or what are the different ways in which your health cover can guard you against um, things that might happen in the later stages of your life, for example, or even how to eat, uh, eat better, how to sleep better, how to live, live more healthily, right? And also moving on, uh, some other stats. So 41% of decision makers are more willing to pay a premium to work with organizations that produce thought leadership content. And 72% uh, 72, 72 of decision makers say short and easy to absorb content makes thought leadership very compelling. So one other example I can think of is, for example, uh, like where we are right now with uh, iconic offices. So uh, the fact that iconic offices uses 
um, events, webinars, workshops, and all that uh, to educate inform and to empower uh, their members, their potential members and the wider public, they are essentially using thought leadership to position themselves as a trusted co-working space. And maybe even the messaging is saying that they are not just a physical co-working space, they are an ecosystem where you can, um, with all you need to succeed in your life, to succeed in your relationships, to succeed in your business. All right, so you can see that through thought leadership, you, if you use it well, whether on a personal or organi organizational level, uh, you'll be able to actually elevate yourself in the eyes of your target audience. All right, so this is actually essentially the power of uh, TL. Right. So the game has changed and we can all take advantage of it. So there are so many ways to uh, share different messaging, to put out content and to start uh, potentially reaching uh, different audiences. So it doesn't matter whether you're, uh, you're, you have a startup. It doesn't matter whether you're an entrepreneur. It doesn't matter whether uh, you are a stay-at-home mom. It doesn't matter whether you're a full-time busy professional. Um, there are definitely different ways in which you can use thought leadership to boost your position. Right? So some other examples of how uh, it's being played out in the marketplace out there, for example, is this. So um, like what kind of person or this, in this case, the something guy or the something gal. So what kind of person do you want to be seen or uh, to be known for? So for example, the finance girl or the business guy or uh, the sports person or the clean eating expert, for example. So uh, there's generally this cycle, all right? So you produce unique content to your audience. You always give value first. And then once you have that, because you give value, naturally, you build up your follower and subscriber base, right? People will start to follow you. Uh, and then after that, out of your base of followers and subscribers, you will have raving and diehard fans. And from there, you can start to look at some uh, productization and monetization strategies, right? We won't go through too much of that, uh, but this is generally the idea of what people uh, can do out there. Right. So for more specific examples, like um, I think this is, uh, if I'm not wrong, Tim Ferriss. So the four hour guy. So the four hour chef, the four hour body, the four hour work week. Right. So uh, he produces unique content. The four hour concept itself is a very disruptive uh, and differentiated idea. All right. So uh, and then he puts out his content through books, podcasts, blogs, emails and all that. And through that, he builds up his followers and subscribers. And from there uh, come the diehard fans, uh, which drives uh, further sales uh, through advertising, through his merchandise, courses, and all. And then it's a virtuous cycle. Okay, So this is the four-hour guy. The other person is the first million guy. Right, so how can you uh, create your first million either through business or through other means? So once again, producing valuable content, putting it out there, adding always, always about adding value, right? And then through that, building up the subscriber base, and then you get your diehard fans. Then once that is, um, once you get that ecosystem going, then you can start to look at uh, monetization, right? The Bitcoin guy, so same thing, unique content, subscribers, diehard fans, and then monetization, right? So we can see how uh, this can play out. Uh, and this is usually what a lot of businesses can, can do, all right? So uh, they put up useful content about their products by educating their audiences on how their products can make their lives better. Right, so I've seen a lot of financial advisors. Uh, instead of uh, just uh, pushing out their their products, their their financial uh, products uh, and all that, uh, what they do is that they create meaningful content. So they write blogs, they write articles, they produce video content on how you can be smarter with your money, how you can start to think about. Um, to prepare for retirement down the road, how you can start to build up a, a savings fund for your kids' education and all that. And through that, once uh, they got their audience engaged, then they can uh, link them up to their respective products, right? So it's all about giving value first, okay? So we can see... Uh, 
Yep, so girl boss as well. So producing unique content first and then be, building up her, uh, her very strong follower and subscriber base and from there, diehard fans. Uh, and then once again, productization and monetization. All right, so hope this gives us all um, a very brief overview of the mechanics of uh, using and leveraging on uh, thought leadership. All right, so let us just go through uh, the, the foundational pillars of thought leadership. All right, so the five M's. Uh, some of my workshops I call, uh, I have the six M's, uh, but because we only have one hour, I decided to just uh, condense it a little bit more. All right, so we have mission, message, market, mood, and measure, which we will go through uh, each one of them uh, through this session. So mission is what is your purpose? Message is what is your idea? So what is it that you want to convey to your audience? What is something which you want them to think about or how would you want them to think differently? All right. Number three is your target audience, your market. Number four, the mode. So what channels are you using? What channels or what platforms are you using? And number five, measure. So what are your metrics? How do we measure and track success? All right, because you can put things out there, you can take a lot of action, but if you don't know how to measure success, then how would you know whether it's effective or not? Okay, so first one is mission. Very simple, but a lot of people miss out on this. All right, so mission is really important. Simon Sinek, uh, one of the thought leaders in leadership development, he says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. So uh, he's very famous for this idea called uh, the golden circle. So I'm sure uh, maybe some of you have heard of it before. So it, uh, it is uh, three concentric circles, the why, the how, and the what, right? So um, a lot of companies, they start from the outside. They work on the what, the product first, and then they work on the how, which is how to sell. And then they don't really think about the why. So what he's saying is focus on the why first, come up with your purpose first, be very, very um, uh, well thought out and very certain, all right, and anchored on your purpose. So it is your principles, it is your philosophy as to what you stand for, all right? So once you've identified your purpose, then you can talk about the products and how to get it out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question for all of us is, why are you doing this? And what are you trying to achieve? Okay, so this is something which uh, I'll get us to think about and to help you further, you can answer it through this way. So I'm doing this to, for, or because, right? So some people might be doing this just for fun. Some people just want to build up an audience. Uh, they want to see uh, how many followers they can get. Some people want to do it for impact and influence. Some people want to do it for genuine transformation. Some people want to do it just for fame. Some people want to do it for money. Uh, they want to do it for lead generation, to generate more sales, to get more clients, uh, to disrupt your industry, to raise awareness, to champion a cause. All right, so uh, maybe if I get uh, us all, if you're happy to share briefly in the chat. So what do you think thought leadership can help you with? All right, so maybe if, uh, if there's any words or any phrases that come to mind, just feel free to uh, pop it into the chat box, all right? All right, so N says to, to impact, yep, so, so that's really good. Uh, so whether we are doing it for a noble cause or even if it's for commercial region, reasons, uh, that, that is fine. Uh, and to answer your question, Simona, yes, yes, you can definitely have more than one reason why you're doing uh, what, what you are planning to do. Okay, so uh, let's see. So Sally says, uh, how can we differentiate thought leadership materials with fake news or information based on personal opinion, which can be biased to the person delivering this message? Very, very good question. Um, so even as a thought leader myself, uh, as a career and professional coach, um, I know there are a lot of people out there as well. Uh, and there are so many gurus and experts and influencers, right? So whether uh, it's like a health 
guru, whether it's a yoga expert, mindfulness expert, or even financial influencers, you know, they, they say, uh, buy this, buy Amazon stock or buy Bitcoin at this time because it's going to the moon, all right? So there, uh, you might chance upon um, uh, preachers of this kind. So what you want to do is, uh, first and foremost, to assess their, their track record. So do these people, are they have they actually produced the results which you are looking for as well, right? So if it's a financial influencer, uh, are they actually financially successful and financially independent or are they just appearing to be rich, All right? Because there is a difference between appearing to be and actually being, all right? Uh, so you can check different sources. So uh, I think one of the uh, acid tests is results, all right? So does that person have a very trusted and credible track record? Uh, can I see myself following that person? Does the person genuinely care? Uh, so definitely it, it, it pays to uh, have a look around and to dig deeper into that person's record and also to not take things at surface value. Take it with a pinch of salt. All right. So if people make certain claims about certain things, uh, see whether it's backed by science, if it's backed by research, if, if it's backed by certain studies, if it's uh, just their personal opinion, that is fine. All right. But if it's their opinion and they have gotten results as uh, from that particular idea, then definitely uh, ascribe more credibility to it. But if it's just what they think and, we, and if it's unproven, uh, then I would say just be very careful, all right? So uh, expose yourself, see different things, but whether you actually listen to them, uh, we, we got to be more discerning about this, all right? I hope that answers your question. Okay, so uh, let me just go on to the next part. Uh, so feel free to bring in the questions as we go along. So those are uh, very good questions. So the next thing is the message. So what kind of message can we actually uh, convey to uh, our target audience? So what you can do is to start to think about your disruptive and differentiating idea, all right? So um, instead of thinking um, in a very conventional way, what are some ways which we could start to look at things beyond the box? Let me just give you some examples, right? So this is a very simple framework which uh, you could consider or you could have uh, in your toolkit, right? So experience, skills and knowledge, as well as your passion, three categories, right? And it's the, through the intersection of these three that you might be able to come up with your disruptive idea. So let me just walk us through uh, some examples, right? So for example, if you have been working 15 to 20 years in the banking industry, that is your profession, that is your full-time job, that is what you have been doing all this while. And then along the way, you've built up skills and knowledge uh, in the areas of compliance, uh, anti-money laundering, due diligence, wealth management, accounting, risk management, uh, and a lot of uh, analytical skills. So uh, this is something that as part of your job, you will gain these skills, knowledge, uh, and competencies. Then as you go along, maybe you think that, okay, so I want to start my own side hustle. I just want to try to use my skills for the greater good or for something cool. And exciting. So maybe along the way, you found out that you actually have passion for kids, right? So uh, you feel that you, you just want to do something to invest in their future, right? So what can you do in this case? So the magic in this is actually looking at the intersection of your experience, your skills and knowledge, as well as your passion. So the sweet spot across these three might lie your niche or your differentiating idea. So in this case, your disruptive and differentiating idea could be personal finance for kids isn't as daunting as it seems. In fact, it can be fun. In fact, uh, we can start them as young as possible. In fact, we can make it like a game. In fact, uh, we, we can involve the ad adults as well. In fact, uh, yeah, it's not as hard as it seems, right? So we can get kids to start their saving plan. We can start 
uh, we can get kids to start building up their financial literacy. We can start to help kids be smarter with their money. All right, because we live in a, an economic world. So we know that the cost of living is only going to increase. So why not get kids uh, financially prepared for the real world as soon as possible? All right. So this is already using what you already have. So trying to stick within your lanes, but in a very innovative and creative way. All right. So uh, based on your experience, based on your skills and your capabilities, and then looking at your passion and where these three intersect. Okay, so this is uh, so if you're stuck, look at what you have already done, look at where you have been so far, and look at where your passion lies. All right, then uh, the intersection might be this your, your sweet spot. Okay, let me give you uh, let's look at another example. So maybe for this person, uh, she's been in the military for 10 years. Right? And then uh, through her military experience, maybe as a commander or as a fighter pilot, uh, she's built up a lot of leadership experience, a lot of mental toughness, and also being able to manage stress, especially in a high pressure environment. Then along the way, she found out that you know, she wants to do, uh, she's really passionate about mountain climbing and endurance running. Right? So if you connect the dots, you can see that there are a lot of transferable skills. There are a lot of things that have parallels. So if you haven't guessed it, most likely uh, her potential disruptive and differentiating ideas is maybe what she could do is um, saying that leaders and executives can draw from the experiences from the military and, and uh, people in endurance sports to better manage high performance teams. So if she does want to become a high performance or leadership coach or expert down the road, she can use the intersection of her experience, skills and knowledge, as well as passion uh, in reaching her target audience. So once again, it's always just using what you already have, leveraging what we uh, have already done in our life so far. And then next example, so maybe in your case, uh, you've worked in retail and hospitality all your life. Uh, you've been raising kids as well, right? And then your skills and knowledge. So you're, through that, you have uh, done a lot of work in writing, video, marketing, content creation, and customer service. Right, so maybe in your uh, work experience uh, on uh, the front lines, uh, maybe you as an administrator for different organizations, you've built up all these skills. Then along the way, you found out that uh, your passion is side hustles. Right, so starting businesses on the sides while having a day job. So in this case, your message could be, all right, that uh, you want to convey this message that being a stay-at-home mom. It's, it's not a career suicide, right? Because there are many ways to hone your skills to remain relevant and even generate side income. So in this case, even through this statement itself, we've identified our potential uh, target audience who is uh, stay-at-home moms. And then the, the message, the messaging is that uh, your career is not over just because you had kids, just because you took a break from your career. In fact, there are, some things which you can still do while being a stay-at-home mom to work on your career skills, to even start building a, a side hustle so, you, so that the money can still come in, right? So this is how you can actually leverage your experience, your skills and knowledge, as well as your passion, All right? So the activity is, uh, which if you can't think of it right now, that's fine. So, uh, so ask yourself, how can you integrate your experience, skills, knowledge, and passion to come up with your disruptive and differentiating idea? So once again, if we look at the sweet spot between uh, the three categories, so uh, experience, skills, and knowledge, as well as passion. Right? So maybe after this call, in your own free spare time, just sit down, uh, open up your, uh, your notepad, uh, Microsoft Word or take out your notebook or piece of paper and then you can just start to list uh, what you have been through in your life so far in terms of your experience, your skills, your knowledge, as well as your passion. All right. And then once you've listed them down, start to look at the intersection. Right. So how can these connect and intertwine with one another? And once you see them aligned, then I think you are many steps closer to finding out your sweet spot. Okay.
So don't worry if you can't think of anything right now. Uh, that is fine, right? Because some of these uh, will actually take time. Okay, so let us move on. Okay, so we've covered mission, we've covered the message. The next thing which we want to look at is the market. So the market is all about your target audience. Meredith Hill says, when you speak to everyone, you speak to no one, right? So it's really, really beneficial to identify your target audience. So once you have your, uh, you have nailed down your mission, all right, why you are doing what you're doing, uh, you have uh, more or less solidified your message, then it also helps to look at uh, who could be your target audience, who would benefit from your message, who would you want to use your message to reach out to, right? who do you want to connect with and uh, influence. Right? So there are a few things to bear in mind as you identify your target audience. Uh, so uh, the different aspects of your target audience. So the first is uh, the demographics. So um, very easily understandable. So age, gender, race, national, nationality, income, uh, maybe their physical location, where they stay, what region, what suburb, what county. You know, that could factor, be a factor as well. Uh, secondly, psychographics the dreams, aspirations, triggers, and fears, mm. right? Uh, so once you've identified at least the demographics and psychographics, then think in terms of uh, think broad first and then start to whittle them down, right? And uh, number four, the more you can picture yourself in the shoes, the better, right? So if you've been in the shoes before facing the exact same problem, then yeah, you can definitely speak from experience. Okay, and then number five, determine your negotiables and non-negotiables, right? So based on um, the previous examples we have looked so far, so for example, uh, the person in the military who loves mountain climbing, uh, the financial advisor who wants to empower kids and so on. So uh, let's look at how this could actually help them identify their target audience. Okay. So maybe this person has identified that in terms of demographics, they want to actually specifically reach out to 25 to 30, 30 year old young professionals and executives who are of middle income level, single or married with no kids. Right? So people who are young, ambitious, go-getting uh, and not too settled yet. So uh, really, really want to establish themselves in their industry. Psychographics, so like we mentioned, ambitious, hungry to learn and to earn, looking forward to the next promotion. Uh, they want to make an impact and to leave a legacy. They're willing to innovate and try new things. Uh, and they're also scared of becoming irrelevant and being left behind, all right? So I think as we read through all this, we can start to paint a picture of how this person is uh, at the back of our minds, all right? Then we go also identify the negotiables and non-negotiables, all right? So for instance, in this case, um, maybe this expert or this coach um, needs to have the, the clients be able and willing to invest at least four to five figures per year in their personal and professional development. That means they, they want to ensure that their target audience is willing to spend not just the time, but also the money to invest in their own career growth. All right, uh, other non-negotiables, uh, their target audience cannot be entitled or cannot be those who are just waiting to be spoon-fed, right? And then the negotiables is uh, them being in the professional services industry. So there's a bit more flexibility in terms of the industries uh, which they operate in, right? So demographics, psychographics, negotiables, as well as your non-negotiables. Okay, moving on. So in this case, um, different practitioner. So 45 to 50 year old senior ex executives uh, in terms of the demographics, middle, middle to higher income levels, six figures plus per year, and people who are really, really established uh, in their careers. Psychographics. Uh, these people generally uh, looking to transition uh, looking forward to a smooth transition into their retirement in about 10 years, right? maybe five to 10 years. Uh, their concerns about having sufficient funds for retirement. They are worried about what the doctor might say in their next medical visit. Uh, they really want to have enough time for themselves and their kids and also their grandkids. And they're generally more risk averse. 
Okay, so we can see that this is in stark uh, difference compared to the, the first target audience which we talked about. Okay, uh, and non-negotiables, the, these people must be willing to understand the basics of finance and estate planning, right? And also they must have at least a net worth of $1 million, right? So maybe this expert is in the financial planning space or in the financial services space, for example. The next one, all right, so demographics, mountain biking lovers. Uh, they live relatively close to Mount Gambia uh, or within the vicinity of a certain outdoor uh, forested or mountainous areas, right? Generally 15 to 55 years old. Um, so the age bracket is quite wide for this case, but hang on to it for a second, all right? Uh, but let's look at the psychographics. So in terms of their tendencies, uh, they are adventure seekers, they love the outdoors, and they are risk-taking. Right? So even though in the demographics, we see that uh, the, age, the age between 15 to 55, uh, but it is justifiable based on their psychographics because these people are willing to get down and dirty. They're willing to roll up their sleeves. They're willing to eat the dirt. Uh, they're willing to just go into the outdoors and rough it out. Right, so we can already paint a picture uh, of these, uh, these people in our audience. Um, so they must have their own bike and their own transport to get to Mount Gambia. They must be willing to spend three to four days in the outdoors. Uh, bikers can be of any skill level. So maybe this practitioner uh, is, an, is in the business of uh, outdoor adventures. So maybe they organize riding tours. Maybe uh, they, they organize uh, different outdoor experiences where uh, thrill seekers and adventure seekers uh, can go after. Right? So there is a, based on their craft and their passion, uh, it definitely suits a, a certain demographic and psychographic uh, within the population. Okay. So with these in mind, uh, so like we before we talked about the, the message, so in terms of defining your market, so start to think about your target audience, right? So based on the message which you really, really want to share, who would you think would benefit from your message the most? And who would you really, really want to impact uh, the most, right? So these are some questions which you can ask yourself uh, as you work through the process of uh, identifying the, the market. Number four, so um, number four is the mode. So when we're talking about the mode, is basically uh, looking at the different channels and platforms which we can use and leverage to convey the message, right? So when you're spreading your message, don't address the crowd, address that person themselves, right? So whenever you're speaking, um, whenever you're putting content out there, make sure you phrase your message as if you are just talking to that one person, all right? Instead of addressing the wider audience, okay? So I've tried this myself. I've uh, put up a lot of LinkedIn content. Um, so I think I, I saw a big difference when I spoke as if I'm just speaking to that one particular uh, person in my target audience rather than speaking to the masses itself. Okay, so how do we get the word out? So there are two parts to this, okay? So it's all about uh, the combination of the platform as well as the delivery. There's a big difference, all right? So the platform is basically the social media outlet itself. So there are so many different platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, Pinterest, uh, Discord, uh, TikTok, you know, there, there's so many out there, WeChat even, yeah. Uh, so there's so many ways, so many channels in which you can use to reach your audience. All right, but each can be utilized differently. Each is used by different people in different amounts at different times, uh, in different formats, in different frequency. 
Some are longer form content, some are text heavy, some are video based, uh, some can hold long form video, some are short video disposable uh, video snippets, uh, so on and so forth, right? So depending on how you want to reach them and how you want to convey your message. So the message could be the same, all right? So for example, right at the beginning, uh, remember we talked about uh, financial literacy for kids can be really fun. So how are you going to reach kids or even their parents through social media, these social media channels? So what will you actually use? Uh, if you were to use Facebook, it might be very different than if you were to use Snapchat. The type of content which you put out might be very different. So um, if it's a short article, it could go on Facebook, it could go on LinkedIn, uh, but maybe for Snapchat or Insta stories, it will be a very short video. So maybe uh, like a 15 second video of you uh, Putting, setting aside coins, popping it into the piggy bank. So it's very visual, it's very uh, engaging to your uh, target audience, right? So, so many different outlets. So this is just a platform in itself, right? So the next part is actually the delivery. So how are you actually going to put things out? So for Facebook, it is, um, it is usable for images, videos, uh, Facebook Live, for live stream, as well as for articles. Okay, uh, for Twitter, you can use it for images, for videos, and very limited uh, text, right? 280 characters. So feel free to correct me if, uh, if things have changed ever since, all right? Um, Pinterest is basically like a visual, um, visual scrapbook, right? You actually pin different images. So it's like if you have a, um, what's that, like a vision board, uh, or like a cork board on your wall, and then you can pin photos of your holiday destinations, your dream house, uh, pictures of your family and all that. So things of interest for you. So uh, Pinterest is very, very image heavy. Uh, YouTube, so definitely video uh, centric. So short form videos, long form videos, educational videos, entertainment videos, instructional videos, uh, and also live streams as well. LinkedIn. LinkedIn is more for uh, professionals because people have their career profiles attached to it. So it generally tends to be more career focused or uh, business facing. Right? So images, videos, live stream and articles, uh, they are readily used and dispatched on that platform. Uh, and then Instagram, so definitely a, a, it's a very visual platform. So images, short form videos, uh, so short Insta stories, disposable videos, as well as uh, live stream and uh, Insta stories. Okay, so these are some things which uh, you can have up your sleeves, but obviously it's not about using all of them. It's about finding what works best for you based on your message, based on your audience. All right. So if you feel that, uh, so based on the previous examples, for example, if you're targeting uh, very senior level executives to help them in planning for their retirement or even helping them in terms of their leadership capabilities as they look at succession planning to raise up the next CEO to take over their position. So they will have very different things in mind compared to young and ambitious professionals. And they will also use different social media platforms. So for example, like people who are starting out in their careers might use all of these channels, right? But people who are really like senior C-suite executives, they might maybe use a bit of Instagram, they might use a lot of LinkedIn, they might use Twitter and all that. So always do research on your target audience, all right? Find, uh, meet them where they hang out, okay? So the question for all of us is, what is your plan for the platform and delivery? So it's about identifying what channels work best for you. And once you've identified that, how are you going to deliver your, your message? Okay. So this brings us to number five, which is measure. 
All right, so once we've uh, established our mission, we know what, why we are doing what we're doing, we've uh, solidified our message, we've uh, identified our market, and then uh, we've also uh, clarified on the mode, which is the channels which we are using. The next thing which we want to look at is uh, measuring. So how are you? How do we know we are actually successful? All right, because if we don't measure things, then they don't get managed. Uh, then, yeah, we won't know whether it's actually effective or worth our time or not. Okay, so Peter Drucker says, what gets measured gets managed. All right, so if you don't, if you don't measure your time you don't manage your time. If you don't measure your finances, you don't manage, you don't manage your finances. If you don't measure uh, the, the people who work for you, then you don't, you're, you aren't managing them well, right? So measure, uh, measure to manage, okay? So the very key question here is how do we measure activities and results? Can anyone tell me what is the difference between activities and results? Is there a difference in the first place? Any thoughts about that? What is the difference between activities and results? Hmm. Cool. Uh, so activity is a process. Result is what comes out of it. Activities should have a result uh, in the direction of the goals. Correct, correct. So, so those are spot on. Uh, so activities are basically what you do to get the results. All right. So activities is doing uh, 50 push-ups, uh, lifting X number of weights, uh, doing X number of repetitions, going to the gym X number of days per week. Result is actually... The, the actual weight loss or the gain in the desired muscle mass, for example, okay? So activities and results are very, very different things. We must both, uh, we must pay attention to the both of them, okay? So for example, activities could be things like the number of posts a day. So how much content you put out a day, the number of articles, videos, and podcasts produced, the number of connection requests sent, the number of calls you make a day, uh, the number of emails you've sent, the number of uh, direct messages you've sent, uh, the number of meetings you have, uh, the number of comments and replies uh, you've sent, right? So these are things uh, which are definitely under your control, right? So you do all this first, then as a natural result, you should get the result, okay? So always be uh, very diligent in the activities and naturally the results should come, all right? But make sure you measure both as well. Uh, so if we look at the results, so as a result of uh, being consistent with the activities, so results could be things like page views, unique visitors, likes, comments, shares, traffic leads, cost per customer acquisition, conversion rates, uh, profits and revenues generated, uh, number of clients secured, businesses and partnerships generated, number of lives touched, funds raised, All right? So uh, it's important to measure both, but activities are something that is definitely within our control. So sometimes you do certain activities, you might not get the results straight away. You might get patchy, inconsistent result, but that's okay. Always tweak your activities and then, uh, and then look at the results eventually. All right. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes people make is that they focus just on the results without putting in much work on the activities. Okay. So this is something really, really to, uh, for us to bear in mind. So what activities and results are you going to track? That is the next question, okay? So start to think about this. Uh, so whenever we want results, results come as a result, as an outcome of activities. Right? So even if you want to become more successful in your career, even if you want to get promoted uh, in the next six months, 12 months, or 18 months, that is the result. But what are some of the activities which you have to do in order to actualize, to help you actualize the result? Right? 
Yeah. A few things to note. Uh, number one, results might not always be quantifiable, but activities are. So the result, uh, so non-quantifiable results are things like, I want to be closer to my family. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better teacher. I want to be a better friend. I want to have more compassion. All right. So it's not really quantifiable in numbers. All right. So you can't really put numbers to that result. All right. But you can put numbers to the activities that bring you closer to that result. So if you want to be a better parent, can't really measure that with numbers, right? Uh, but you can actually measure the activities. So like spending time with your kids is very measurable. The number of hours, the number of times per week you hang out or go out together. All right, so that is that one. Uh, next one is results might not always be controllable, but activities are, which we mentioned. You have full control of the activities you take. Control the controllables, especially in today's day and age where there's a lot of things that seem out of whack. Number four, focus on activities. Look forward to the results. Okay. And last but not least, consistency over intensity. All right. At the end of the day, it's all about uh, being faithful and diligent in doing the right things, doing things that really matter, doing things that really move the needle forward. So just to wrap things up, we've covered the mission, the message, the market, the mood, the measure, right? So um, mission, once again, is the purpose, why we are doing what we're doing. Number two, message is what you're trying to convey, right? Your disruptive and differentiated idea. Number three is your um, target audience, your market. Number four, the mood, how are you going to meet them? What platforms and what modes of delivery you're going to use and number five how are you going to track uh, the activities and the results okay so these are the five uh, which you can have uh, in your thought leadership arsenal